Okay, this is the simile of the saw. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pandika's Park. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Malia Paguna was associating over much with bhikkhunis. He was associating so much with the bhikkhunis that if any monk spoke dispraise of these bhikkhunis in his presence, he would become angry and displeased and would make a case of it. And if any monk spoke dispraise of the venerable Malia Paguna, in those, pre those bhikkhunis' presence, they would become angry and displeased and make a case of it. So much was the venerable Malia Paguna associating with the bhikkhunis. Then a certain monk went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told the Blessed One what is taking place. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come, monk, tell the monk Malia Paguna in my, my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir, he replied. He went to the venerable Malia Paguna and told him, the teacher calls you, Fred, friend Paguna. Yes, friend, he replied. He went to the, the blessed one. After paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The blessed one asked him, Paguna, is it true that you're associating over much with bhikkhunis? That you're, you are that you are associating so much with the bhikkhunis that if any monk speaks dispraise of those bhikkhunis in your presence, you become angry and displeased and make a case of it. And if any monk speaks dispraise of you in the bhikkhunis' presence, they become angry and displeased and make a case of it. Are you associating so much with the bhikkhunis as it seems? Yes, venerable sir. Paguna, <clears throat> are you not a clansman that's gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness? Yes, venerable sir. Paguna, is it not proper, it is not proper for you a clansman gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness to associate over much with bhikkhunis. Therefore, if anyone speaks dispra dispraise of those bhikkhunis in your presence, you should abandon any desire and any thought based on the household life. In other words, give up getting angry at him. Therein you should train, my mind will be unaffected, and I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for his welfare with a mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. That is how you should train, Paguna. Now you can change that loving kindness to forgiveness. Loving kindness is a very big, wide topic. Forgiveness is a part of loving kindness. If anyone says those monks, if any, if anyone gives those bhikkhunis a blow with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife in your presence, you should abandon any desire and any thought based on the household life. And therein you should train thus, my mind will be unaffected. And I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for, for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. That is how you should train. If anyone speaks dispraise in your presence and you should abandon any dis 
desires and any thoughts based on the household life. And herein you should train thus. My mind will be unaffected and I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for his welfare with the mind of loving kindness without inner hate. If anyone should give you a blow with his hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife, you should abandon any desires, any thoughts based on the household life. Therein you should train thus. My mind will be unaffected and I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. That is how you should train. Then a blessed one addressed the monks thus. Monks, there was an occasion when the monks satisfied my mind. Here I address the monks thus. Monks, I eat at a single session. By doing so, I am free from illness and affliction. I enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. Come, monks, eat at a single session. <clears throat> By doing so, you will be free from illness and affliction, and you will enter light, in, enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. And that's just about the opposite of what most people think. Oh, I'll lose weight if I cut down on... Uh, if I don't even eat an evening meal or a morning meal. But coming here from Asia, I gained weight because the, the kinds of oils that's being used with the, the different foods. And I only eat one, <coughs> one meal a day, so... And when you start to feel a cold coming on, you should stop eating altogether and just take rest. Take your vitamins and lay down and take rest. Drink a lot of water. Now, I, as an example, there was this lady that, uh, was uh, letting me stay at her family house. And she had this cold that had lasted for a month. And just being in proximity of her, I started to catch the cold. But I was, I left and I went to, from St. Louis to Washington, D.C on the bus so I couldn't lay down and take rest. And I caught the cold pretty good. And as soon as I got to Washington, D.C., I told the head monk, don't look for me for a while. I'm, I'm just going to be taking it easy because I have this cold and it seems to be pretty bad. Well, after three days of not eating and taking rest, and taking the vitamins, I was over it. And it took her six weeks to get over it. So uh, not eating is a good thing when you're sick because the, the enzymes from your pancreas that go, generally go into your stomach to digest food now it starts spreading out through your body and it starts attacking any illness that you have. So there is some scientific uh, method in doing it this way. So eating, um, eating just one meal a day is actually 
probably the healthiest thing you can do for your body on a long-term basis. But when, if you're going to do that, you need to do that knowing what food is and how it affects you. You need to eat hard food and soft food. Hard food is stuff that takes a while to digest. Nuts, uh, sticky rice, um, beans, that takes a while to digest, so it's, you don't get hungry in the evening. And I had no need to keep on instructing those monks. I only had to arouse mindfulness in them. Suppose there was a chariot on even ground at a crossroads, harnessed with thoroughbreds, waiting with a goad lying ready, so that a skilled trainer or a charioteer of horses to be tamed might mount him, and taking the reins in his left hand and the goad in his right hand, might drive out and back by any road wherever he likes. So too, I had no need to keep instructing these monks. I only had to arouse mindfulness in them. Therefore, monks, abandon what is unwholesome. Devote yourself to wholesome states. What does that mean? Abandon yourself to what's unwholesome. What is unwholesome? Anything that you take personally, this is me, this is mine, this is who I am, is unwholesome. Why? Because it has craving in it. It's real easy to get caught up in emotional upsets because of old habitual tendencies. Um... <clears throat> I had a student in Seattle that she got, uh, oh, what do you call that? She got uh, a panic, panic attack, yeah. And every time she got a panic attack before I started teaching her, she had to run away and get away from people and hide in her room with her, the drapes closed for three days before she could start feeling like she could come out again. But I taught her about this kind of meditation. And we went to, I, I went to a place and I was giving a talk and she was kind of sitting in the middle of the audience and she started to feel a panic attack coming on. And she started breaking out in a sweat and she was really getting tense and tight. And then she thought, you know, if what this monk is telling me works, then I should be able just to use the six R's. And I should be able to be able to let it go pretty quickly. It took her two minutes of just using the six R's and relaxing into it, not getting involved in all of those old habitual tendencies, those old thoughts and ways of trying to hand, handle it. Now she knew, she found out a new way to handle it. And she could let go of it in two minutes. And after a little bit of training, she was able to not have panic attacks anymore. So this stuff does work, but you have to be very uh, persistent with the practice. After you get better at it, what you practice, you get better at. And then 
there's real personality change that starts to occur. So letting go of your old ways of reacting, like you always act when this kind of feeling comes up. And letting go of that old way of doing it and developing your mind with a new habit of seeing that coming and relax into it and let it be. But that's only half of it. You have to bring up something wholesome afterwards. And that's what smiling is all about. That is a wholesome state. The more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. As you heard me say this afternoon. <laughs> So this is what, what the Buddha's teaching is about, letting go of the unwholesome and developing the wholesome. For this will be to your growth, increase, and fulfillment in this Dhamma and discipline. Suppose there is a big salad tree grove near a village or a town and it was choked with castor oil weeds and some man would appear desiring his good and welfare and protection. He would cut down and throw out the crooked saplings that rob sap. He would clean up the interior of the grove and tend the straight well-formed saplings so that the salad tree grove later would come to growth increase and fulfillment. So too, abandon the, what is unwholesome and devote your mind to what's uh, wholesome states. For that will lead to your growth, increase and fulfillment in this Dhamma and discipline. Formally, in this same Savati, there was a housewife named Vidika, and a good report of Mistress Vidika had spread thus, Mistress Vidika is gentle, Mistress Vidika is meek, she is peaceful. Now Mistress Vidika had a maid named Kali, who was clever and nimble and neat in her work. The maid thought, a good report of my lady has spread thus. Mistress Vidika is gentle. She's meek, she's peaceful. How is it now while well, she does not show anger and is nevertheless actually present in her or is it absent? Or else is it just because my work is neat that my lady shows anger though it's actually present in her. Suppose I test my lady. And the maid Callie got up late. Then Mistress Vidika said, Hey, Callie, what is it, madam? What's the matter that you get up so late? Nothing is the matter, madam. Nothing is the matter, you wicked girl, yet you get up so late. And she was angry and displeased and scowled. Then the maid Callie thought, the fact is that while my lady does not show anger, it's actually present in her, not absent. And it's just because my, my work is neat that my lady shows no anger though it's actually present in her, not absent. Suppose I test my lady a little more. So the maid Callie got up later in the day. Then Mistress Fadika said, Hey Callie, what is it, madam? What is the matter that you get up later in the day? Nothing is the matter, madam. 
Nothing is a matter, you wicked girl, yet you get up still later in the day. And she was angry and displeased and spoke words of displeasure. Then the lady, then the maid Callie thought, the fact is, while my lady does not show anger, it's actually present in her, not absent. And it's just because my work is neat and my, that my lady shows no anger, though it's actually present in her. Suppose I test my lady a little more. So Callie got up still later in the day. Then Mistress Fadika said, Hey, Callie, what is it, madam? What's the matter that you get up still later in the day? Nothing is the matter, madam. Nothing is the matter, you wicked girl. Yet you still get up later in the day, and she was angry and displeased. And she took a rolling pin and hit her with a gave her a blow on the head and cut her head. Then the maid Callie, with blood running down her head from, her, from the cut, denounced her mistress to the neighbors. See, ladies, the gentle ladies work. See, lady, the meek ladies work. See, ladies, the peaceful ladies work. How can she become angry and displeased with her only maid for getting up late? How can she take a rolling pin and give her a blow on the head and cut her head? Then later, a bad report of Mr. Mistress Fadika spread thus. Mistress Fadika is rough. She's violent. She's merciless. So too, monks. Some monk is extremely gentle, extremely meek, extremely peaceful, so long as disagreeable courses of speech do not touch him. But it is when disagreeable courses of speech touch him that it can be understood whether that monk is really kind, gentle, and peaceful. I do not call a monk easy to admonish, who is easy to admonish and makes himself easy to admonish for the sake of getting robes, alms food, resting place, and medicines. Why is that? Because that monk is not easy to admonish, nor makes himself easy to admonish when he gets no robes, alms food, resting place, or uh, medicinal requisites. Those are the four things that monks have to have. They cut out, cut out a whole lot of other stuff, but they have to have food, have to have clothing, have to have a place to stay, and medicines for when you're sick. But when a monk is easy to admonish and makes himself easy to admonish because he honors, respects, and reveres the Dhamma, him I call easy to admonish. Therefore, monks, you should train thus. We shall be easy to admonish and make ourselves easy to admonish because we honor, respect, and revere the Dhamma. That is how you should train monks. Monks, there are these five courses of speech that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. When others address you, their speech may be timely or untimely, when others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. When others address you, their speech may be gentle or harsh. When others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. When others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Herein, monks, you should train thus. 
our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with him we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train. So what are we saying here? It doesn't matter what somebody else says or how they say it. It doesn't matter whether it's a lie or the truth. Your job is to radiate loving kindness to that person and use that person as the reminder to start radiating loving kindness to all, all beings in all the directions and keep that with you as much as you can. What somebody else says, it can be very much their opinion that doesn't have anything to do with you. It's just sometimes people get emotional and they say things. You don't have to take it personally. If you do, then what happens in your mind? It gets tight. It gets tense. Somebody comes up to you and they, st they come at you with anger. What's your first reaction? Get angry yourself and then throw that anger back at them. And then you start arguing. And they're talking and you're talking at the same time. You don't hear what they say, they don't hear what you say. Eventually they go off and go away. What do you think about? What they said, what you said, what you should have said. And I'm right. They, they shouldn't have come at me that way. And they're wrong. And then you have the same kind of, the same thought running over again. Just like it was on a tape deck. Who has an attachment? Who didn't like that situation? Who is making a big deal out of something that's not? Who is causing them self-pain? So, the whole point of this sutta is to get you to see how you can practice loving kindness and compassion even with people that come at you with their anger. It doesn't matter what they say absolutely does not. That's their opinion. That's their ideas. They can have their opinion. They can have their ideas. But what you do with what arises in the present moment dictates what happens in the future for you. <clears throat> so somebody comes up and they start giving you a hard time for whatever reason at all. Use them as your object of meditation and start radiating loving kindness to them. It's the fastest way I know of to make anger calm down. And it works. It really does work. Sometimes some people can come here and they don't really like each other and they start getting angry with each other. Then they come running down to me and at, at my cabin 
and start yelling at each other while they're in the cabin. So what do I do? I don't get in the middle of it. I'm not that dumb. I start radiating loving kindness because I see that both of them are worked up and they're really emotional and they're saying things that can be hurtful to each other. So I start radiating loving kindness. And after just a short period of time, they start talking instead of yelling from emotion. And then they find out that it's really not that much of a problem. It was just an emotional upset. And I keep radiating loving kindness to them. And before long, they start laughing. And then they say, you know, I've, I've got a lot to do. Thanks, Bonte. I'll see you later. And I haven't said a word. Now, what happens when you get into an emotional fight of some sort and you have repeat thoughts and then you see somebody else? What do you talk about? You talk about what a turkey that other person is and they got angry at you and you had a fight with them and then you start into your gossip, which is empty words that aren't necessarily true. Bhante, I'm here representing the turkeys. <laughs> It's just an expression. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> I'll explain. If you get a chance, go down and visit the turkey. He's great fun to talk with. He really is. <coughs> but when you see somebody that's building themselves up to get angry and they might start out by saying angry words to you, look at their body and look at their body language and you can see that they're suffering because you know what it like, feels like to be angry. You can see that they're suffering. So have compassion for them and start radiating loving kindness to them. And they'll simmer down very quickly and then you can discuss what the problem really was. And when you leave, then you, your mind is clear. You're not thinking and rethinking and rethinking that same statement or set of statements. So the next person you see, you can be giving them loving kindness. <laughs> but quite often you see people that get angry and uh, they're driving a car. That's really scary because they're not driving. They're thinking, and they're not paying attention at all. And that's how probably 90% of the accidents happen, because they're thinking about something else and not paying attention to what they're doing while they're doing it. So it's a real important aspect of the Buddha's teaching and if you can get in the habit of everyone that you talk to 
you start radiating loving kindness to them while you're talking. then your mind is going to have a lot more peace and calm in it. Your mind is be going to be, become much softer. And it gets to be fun. I mean, you wind up laughing with people, not laughing at people, but laughing with people or animals. and your, your mind is uplifted. So this is a real important thing. Uh, one of the complaints I've heard about uh, people say about Buddhism, it's, it's, uh, it's only, meditation is only about sitting. And that happened because of a lot of the Zen monks that first came to this country. That was their practice, was just sitting in meditation. But I wrote a book that says, uh, meditation is life, life is meditation. And in the book, I'm trying to get you to realize that you have to carry your meditation with you all the time. If you want personality development, how do you affect the world around you? When you have anger, you affect the world around you negatively. When you have loving kindness in your mind, you affect the world around you positively. And they, there's this place in California in Boulder Creek called uh, Heart Math. Is that what is it? Yeah. And they have machines that they think they can measure loving kindness. And they say when you really get good at loving kindness, it goes out for 500 feet all around you. And I don't believe that. That's very limiting. And I, I say that because of my direct experience. My teacher, I was in Thailand at the time. I heard that he had had a stroke and he was in the hospital. And as soon as I heard that, I started radiating loving kindness to him. And I did it for a period of time. He got out of the hospital. He wrote an, a letter to me, which he never did before, thanking me for sending him so much loving kindness. How did he know? I didn't tell him. How did he know? So you can affect the whole world around you when you radiate loving kindness. And don't let your mind get caught up in um, emotional nonsense. And you're going to forget and you're going to get caught but you can't criticize yourself because you make a mistake. Can't criticize yourself. You have to forgive yourself and then start over again. If you criticize yourself, you're practicing having an unwholesome mind. We all have the same expectation. We all have the expectation of being perfect at whatever we do. And you're not going to be. That's the truth. You're going to forget sometimes and you're going to get caught. But as soon as you, you see that you're causing yourself pain, then 6R, smile, laugh at yourself for being dumb, and continue. Monks, suppose a man 
came with a hoe in a basket and said, I shall make this great earth be without earth. He would dig here and there, he would churn soil here and there, he would spit here and there, he would urinate here and there, saying, be without earth, be without earth. What do you think, monks? Could that man make this great earth be without earth? No, venerable sir. Why is that? because this great earth is deep and immeasurable and it's not easy to make it without earth. Eventually the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So two monks, there are these five courses of speech that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. When others address you, their speech may be timely or untimely. When others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. When others address you, their speech may be gentle or harsh. When others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. When others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Herein you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. We shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with him, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train. Monks, suppose a man came with turmeric, crimson, indigo, or carmine and said, I shall draw pictures and make pictures appear on empty space. What do you think, monks? Could that man draw pictures and make pictures appear on empty space? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because space is formless and non-manifestive. It's not easy to draw pictures that there or make pictures appear there. Eventually, that man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So too, monks, there are these five chords of, five courses of speech. Uh, that others may use when they address you. Their speech, speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. When others address you, their speech may be timely or untimely. When others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. When others address you, their speech may be gentle or harsh. When others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. When others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Herein you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. 
we shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with him. We shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind that is abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train. Monks, even if bandits were to sever you savagely, limb by limb, with a two-handed saw, he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. Herein, monks, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected, and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with them, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train. <clears throat> so this sutta right here tells you again that you have to carry this with you all the time. This is an all the time practice, as much as you can remember. If you keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in mind, do you see any course of speech trivial or gross, that you could not endure. No, venerable sir. Therefore, monks, you should keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in mind. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So, it sounds like an easy practice, but it's hard because you have to remember to do it. And when you're practicing forgiveness, you have to keep the forgiveness as close to you as your skin. Always be forgiving Forgiving yourself for making mistakes, for not understanding. We're probably our own worst enemies because we get caught up in the ideas that we're supposed to know and understand and we forget. But you can't criticize yourself if you forget. That's unwholesome. You have to forgive yourself for making a mistake. Mistakes are not bad, as long as you only do one. Learn from your mistake. Okay, I blew it. That's fine, you can do that. But don't keep doing the same mistake over and over again. Learn from your mistake. Come back and Sincerely, keep your practice going. That's how there's personality development. That's how you let go of uh, all kinds of problems. Now, you're made up of five things, right? The psychophysical process is five things. You have a physical body. You have feeling. Feeling is pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. You have perception. That's the part of the mind that names things. <coughs> A pleasant feeling arises. Perception says, that's pleasant. Painful feeling arises. Perception says, that's painful. You have thoughts. 
You have consciousness. Now, one of the biggest mistakes that we make, and it's happened from time immemorial, is when we have a painful thing, it doesn't matter whether it's physical or mental. You treat them both in the same way. When you have a painful thing arise, what we wind up doing is trying to think the pain away. We're trying to control, control the pain with our thoughts. And that makes the pain bigger and more intense. So what actually can be not that big a deal in your mind, because you're trying to control it, I don't like this feeling, I don't want it there, and I wish it would stop, then you become frustrated and you get more angry and you really start building this up into this huge mountain that you don't know how to overcome. You can't go around it, you can't get over it, you can't get under it. So what to do? Use the six R's. And this big problem turns into a little bump. But we have a tendency to build these things up by overthinking them and trying to control our feeling with our thoughts. And that doesn't work. So, let go of that. Relax into it. Smile. Come back to your object of meditation. Stay with your object of meditation. And it doesn't matter how many times you do it. So you might have to be bouncing back and forth for a little while because this, this attachment is so big. And that's okay. Don't put any of your expectations on when it's supposed to happen. Because it's not going to happen when you want it to. It'll happen when it's right to. Let go of serious thoughts and have fun. I know you're not going to hear many meditation teachers tell you that you're supposed to have fun in life because life is suffering, you know. Well, it can be or not. It's your choice what you do with it. The more you have fun with your meditation, the easier the meditation becomes, and the faster your progress becomes. It really does work. Okay, so I've been talking for a while. I'm almost afraid to ask because it'll get so deafeningly quiet. Does anybody have a question? Yes. When you're practicing um, the forgiveness meditation, do you start with someone that is maybe a little bit easier to forgive? Yourself. Others, but when you're past that, you They'll start. come up on their own. You don't have to ask them to come up. And you stay with them until you feel like, yeah, I, I really do, I really do forgive that person. And there's no time limits on it. Yeah. If you have a person come up and you stay with that person and another person comes up. Uh, Just tell them to wait in line. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get your turn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
just one person at a time. Yeah. Could you talk about the how, the how process of forgiving? Are, there, are you applying the six R's? When, when, yeah, when it's needed, yes, of course. I thought I did that in the instructions, didn't I? Yeah, I think he's asking a little bit differently. Well, what does that mean? Six R's to forgive, and you're not. You're no, you're, you're not using the six R's to forgive. No, I'm you're trying to make that distinction. Yeah. You you use the six R's when your mind gets distracted and caught up in a story, and then you come back to the forgiveness. Putting it in your heart, putting that person with it in your heart and forgiving them. It sounds a lot easier than it actually can be because of the attachment. The reason they come up is because you had some problems. And your mind, because of that attachment, is going to say, Nah, I don't want to forgive this person person. <laughs> so you just six R that and go back and do it again. And you might have to verbalize it a lot in your mind. Forgive that person a lot before your mind actually is ready to say, okay, I'm tired of doing this. I don't want to do it anymore. Let's just forgive him all the way. <laughs> yeah. I did two weeks of forgiveness work and I never got beyond myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Well, there are some people that come up in your mind that they really cause you big problem. And it is hard to, I mean, you can put yourself with them. You didn't cause the problem, they did. So you forgive them for that because of that attachment. And the attachment to it is I. I don't like that. I, I don't like what they did. I'm angry with what they did. I, 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 I. And you have to let go of that. You did it for two weeks. I did it for two years. No. Just practicing after watching the And I, it wasn't that I had any big uh, true enemies that I really hated, but there was a lot of little stuff that I was trying to clear out just to see what would happen. And I got to a place in my mind said, Okay, you don't need to forgive anymore. And I'm starting to think, oh, I've done so much other stuff. I have to forgive all this stuff. And my mind said, no. If you want to keep going, keep going. I don't care. But you can stop now. Oh, okay. I'll do that. But the reason that I, I wanted to do that was so that I could see every little aspect in me so I could recognize it when other people have that sort of thing so it's, it makes it easier for me to communicate how to forgive. Okay. Anything else? 
Okay, let's hear some merit then. <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.